на сегодня. Cool. Uh, всем привет, мы начинаем. Это Анастасия Соломина, и сегодня у нас в гостях Стивен Хейс, основатель терапии принятия ответственности всеми нами горячо любимой. И это интервью ответит на uh, целый ряд вопросов, да, эксклюзивно для проекта «Чистые когниции». Я переключаюсь на английский, и мы начинаем. Окей, okay. so, a couple of words been said, and let's dive right into it. Uh, I think it would make sense to begin with the questions about the future, uh, big scope and everything. So uh, our project is oriented at uh, evidence-based or empirically supported therapies. So the future of research, we'll begin with that. Uh, I was uh, very lucky to attend the last ACBS conference and um, uh, I noticed that uh, there was uh, there were many things said about uh, future contextual behavioral research and uh, things like ideographic research and uh, tracking behavior right in the moment in session or outside a session with wearable devices was uh, mentioned. And uh, it would be very interesting to see what you think uh, would be, you know, like the most exciting research that waits for us in the nearest future. What would you personally like to uh, get to know, get to check, get to see what's been checked and so on? Yeah, there's a lot of churn right now. Um, Evidence-based therapy went through a phase where it was defined, I think, almost as protocols targeting traditional psychiatric syndromes in randomized trials, period. I mean, period. Uh, done, finished, period. Without understanding how those change happen, that didn't have to be in there. You didn't, even know, you didn't even have to measure processes of change, never mind do a mediational analysis without ever questioning whether or not uh, these uh, syndromes are actually organizing people into categories that fit who they are and without being uh, necessarily clear about how practitioners who after all will not follow a protocol in a linear rigid way no matter how much you to wag a finger at them and try to shame them into doing it why because the Protocol might say that this is session three and you do X and the person comes in and says, my dog died yesterday. And you are not gonna go, oh, well, now let's talk about your cognitions. I mean, not if you're a caring human being, you're not gonna do that. So the dirty lie is that evidence-based therapy is not actually applied that way by people called therapists, last time I checked, were people who are dealing with people called clients who have individual lives unfolding and have events happening. So how can we get the science to line up with the reality of being human and needing help and the reality of being human and wanting to be of use? And so uh, I think, uh, Uh, you know, contextual behavioral science comes out of a kind of pragmatic wing of the behavioral tradition that has always been more focused on the individual, not in isolation. The individual can, can mean the couple, it can mean the family, but I mean focused on a unit treated as if they matter, not treated as if they're an error term inside a collective. And as the traditional psychiatric diagnosis breaks down, why is it breaking down? Because the purpose of it was to get to what those trajectories are. What, the, what is the etiology course in response to treatment? That's the purpose of syndromes is to teach you, is to give you a way, a strategic way of finding where did it come from? How does it change mechanistically in terms of processes of change over time? And what can you do to change those trajectories that will produce better outcomes? And in physical medicine, sometimes, uh, you know, looking at features and putting them into collectives, like cancer, for example, didn't mean that people would survive cancer better. Having little names for this versus that lesion with, you know, if it's red over here or blue over there, didn't 
give you survival rates that were improving fast enough. It wasn't until they went back to the lab and say, okay, how did this happen? And started looking at the oncogenes and you know what happens with the you know cell systems and epigenetic impact of environmental pollutants and on and on it goes that we started coming up with people surviving cancer at much higher rates in the same way. We are at the early stages of a complete rethink of what evidence-based therapy is. It's not gonna be protocols for syndromes. Well, what is it gonna be? It can't go back to, uh, most of my clients do well, box scores. It can't go back to, I feel it, I feel it, I know it works, please. No, the history of humankind shows that experimental science is one of the best inventions we ever came up with, but, we're gonna have to figure out how to target it. I know this is a long answer, but you've asked a really big question. So forgive me for going on just a little longer. Mm -hmm. I've become especially rigid around this after realizing that what Peter Molinar first pointed out in 2004, that a feature of how you go from a collective to an individual that has been known in the physical sciences since it was proposed in 1884, by Boltzmann and proven by von Neumann in 1932 and Birkhoff in 1931 to the mathematical uh, uh, acceptability uh, uh, in the entire physical sciences called the ergodic theorem. The ergodic theorem, which was about how to model in space and time the, the behavior of elements, molecules, for example, or flowing rivers, for example, and then the level of analysis needed to be able to, to make sense of those phenomena basically concluded more than almost 100 years ago that you can't take, for example, a volume of gas and, and model the behavior of the molecules of the gas unless the gas molecules are what's called ergodic. What would that mean? They don't develop or change, number one and their underlying dynamical systems, that is the elements that are influence them are identical in the same sequence at the same time for all the molecules. Does this sound like a human being? No, nope, that's exactly what I'm thinking. <laughs> so by definition, processes change are developmental. By definition, treatment is designed to change. As soon as it's not stationary, you can't use group statistics to tell what the individuals are doing, number one. And the dynamic model is obviously wrong because we're all being influenced by different things at different times and different sequences and combinations. Yes, there's some similarities. Well, so in other words, we've done 80, 90, 95% of the research done in psychology violates the ergodic theorem. And what that means is it doesn't apply to individuals. Well, what a train wreck. How did we get there that we're using methods and statistics that force us to commit a logical error? And it's only been recently that people have realized, oh my goodness, this well-established fact in the physical science is, is being violated in the behavioral sciences. So here's where I am. I think where we're going is high density longitudinal data where each individual is allowed to be looked at as an individual and the things that influence them in the old style way, we used to say functional analysis or things like that, mm -hmm. but then in a new way that involves all the different processes of change that we've learned about over the last uh, 40 or 50 years of evidence-based work and treatment are allowed to look at and kind of model what that person's life is like. And the target of treatment shouldn't be the, this made up thing called syndromes. Uh, it should be the known processes of change that are reflected ideographically by the person. So we don't need a psychology of the one. What we need is a psychology that's respectful of the one and then gathers people into subpopulations based on their real similarity of how their life unfolds. And they can give us treatment kernels targeting that. So. I'm very hopeful we will be close to a time where our a few weeks at the beginning will give us high density longitudinal data. We'll know the person from the inside out because we'll be pinging them and looking at measures that are properly focused on processes mm -hmm. of change. And we'll be able to do a functional analysis and look at what's known 
about what are the elements, the treatment elements, not the whole big package that will empower that person to live a, a more effective and successful life. To, to me, that's a, a far more exciting vision than this one size fits all uh, categorical kind of thing, which is uh, harmful, I think, to human beings. They're coming in saying, I have BPD and also and you get this long list of categories. Mm. Oh, wait a minute. Can I do this quick thing and then I'll end. In the STAR-D trial, one of the largest trials ever done with so-called major with, I have to put it in scare quotes because I don't like using these terms anymore, but with major depressive disorder, MDD, mm -hmm. 4,000 4, people almost. How many of them had a collection of signs and symptoms just outside the, inside the DSM that were so unusual, so special, so unique that they would only apply to one-tenth of one percent? of those 4,000 people. How many people were that odd? The answer is more than half. How many different combinations were there in those 4,000? The answer is 1,100. These categories are lies. They're boxes, they're prisons, they're clown suits that we force people in. And uh, enough is enough. I mean, I, I think evidence-based therapists have to just say no to that. That we are not gonna use categories that we put atop people. We're gonna do the hard work to understand that person and use categories that fit them. So that's where I think we're going. And then some of the exciting research that I'm looking at are the ones that use these high density longitudinal measures, create dynamical systems and networks, test them empirically, look at what's known about processes of change and help us target what's really of importance to that individual. And that's a, what clinicians have wanted to do and have been doing as best they can, but without much help from the scientists who've been forcing them into the ergodic error, not even knowing that they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This this sounds extremely inspiring, but what I kept thinking when hearing you is like, Russian science is so far behind that. I mean, uh, just as you started, you said like, we can go back to the categories or we can go back to, oh, this works, I believe that, but that's basically what happens here. Like just two things, DSM, oh, wow, that's so great. Let's go and uh, pray to that or, psychotherapy is magic so high density longitudinal data uh -huh. <laughs> Hard well, to imagine. To, but you have a great benefit there of maybe not having to live inside that legacy let's create a pathway that fits what we know now and you know after all if you take something like D the dsmization the biomedicalization of human suffering inside this ergodic error that normative categories apply to people. Um, if, if we avoid that error, I mean, if you look at something like people who are bringing science into uh, the developing world, uh, you know, like in Africa or things like that, and people like Vikram Patel, the Time 100 guy, now at Harvard, did his important work in India, psychiatrist, I don't know if you know his name, but every place in the world where we've not had the DSM or the ICD, and then we put it into the culture, everything gets worse. Every single time. So, you know, we've done this experiment. This is not helpful to the human beings. And so uh, I don't know if behind is the right way to think about it. You know, maybe at the edge and being able to look at what is most progressive uh, because you have set a you know, a long history of leadership in terms of academics and research and so forth. And in this area, evidence-based therapy, not so much, but you know, that combination of basic science, you know, of, you know, from Pavlov on, if I, you know, mm -hmm. of, you know could, can give us a, a, a a new way forward that I think uh, may be a real opportunity to make an impact.
Yeah, that should sound very inspiring. And um, well, I'm thinking that all that brings us to another question that uh, uh, like who in that sense can call themselves evidence-based psychotherapists, I mean, practitioners. Like if we cannot say that uh, following protocol is good, and yeah. uh, at the same time, uh, I think quite uh, uh, quite a logical thing to say is that when you apply something differently than the way it was uh, studied, you can get different results. So uh, your interventions won't be evidence based if you do something, you know, that you created in session or whatever. So uh, does it even make sense then to call yourself evidence based therapists or whatever? I I think it does, and I think we can do it in a way that's far more sophisticated than this technicization of interventions that were do, that have been done. Because that idea that says, oh, if you do it differently, then you don't know if it's evidence-based. Well, excuse me, show me that you can do it the same way. Yeah. When I'm when I'm talking to my class about this, uh, you know, I, I, I start the lecture, I'm talking, suddenly I stop and I say, okay, let us now all describe everything that's happened in this room over the minutes since the class started till now. And they look at me like, oh, no, say, you really have to say everything, everything. And they start a little bit, you know, well, you said this, yeah, but I wasn't the only one, there are other people in here. Who, uh, well, I looked at Sally, you know, yeah, but you weren't the only one looking, what else? And we start pushing and pushing, and then you realize, wait a minute, this would be the rest of eternity to describe this. And even if I took on a film that was multi-sensory and it knew everything, not just the visual stream and auditory, but also sensation, everything, 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 I still wouldn't know because I wouldn't know how to categorize it and speak to it. That's exactly what science is trying to do, to take this stream of everything and put it into ways of speaking that do what? That allow you to make a difference. So be, just because you say a technique can be replicated, no, 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 that's not because now how do you know that that's true? How about this? When you take measures of whether or not people follow the technique and you predict outcomes versus competency measures that look at is it sensitive to context? Was it well delivered, etc.? Almost always, these formalistic measures of adherence to the protocol don't predict outcomes. Even in the studies, coming up with the techniques that you supposedly have to do that rigid way. Excuse me, can you please explain that? Something is wrong. If even within the studies that lead to these rigid rules, a looking at it in terms of rigid rules isn't helpful. So now here's how we need to be evidence-based in my opinion. It's not a free-for-all. The proximal outcomes of intervention are changes in processes that are known to link to long-term outcomes. We know that changes in signs and symptoms don't link as well to outcomes as process that then as do processes of change. We know that. We know that processes of change, I'll give, I'll give an example, process of change. How about attentional flexibility? Is the person able to focus on something and stay if it's of importance without <laughs> just, or are they able to shift off when something else is of importance? Can you actually see that in session? Yeah, you can. You can see people who will just come back to the same thing over and over again, no matter what, you can't get a change. Or people who can't focus on anything or people who if there's a, a fire alarm going off in the hallway, hardly even notice it. Or who never say, you know, are you feeling sick when you're, when you're coughing and sneezing? I mean, there are people who are foggy, people who are upset, okay. Do we know that that relates to outcomes? Yes, we do, we have lots of, indications, all that work on mindfulness, that being able to allocate attention in a flexible, fluid, and voluntary way to broaden it, narrow it, hold it, or change it. Metacognitive therapy, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, ACT, DBT, all that. You put that measure in there, and it will predict long-term outcomes for the person. Can you measure that in session? Yeah, you can. Are there 
specific things you can do repeatedly, self-reports and other things. Yes, there are. When you make, when you create something, let's say you have an evidence-based model that you're following and it has evidence-based techniques and kernels, things that you can deploy in small ways because you're not gonna put a whole protocol into someone's life. You're gonna say something or do something over the next few minutes, okay? Are they there to be drawn from? Yes. And can you make up new things but still see if the processes change? Yes, you can do that. So it seems to me we should take the shackles off the clinicians. Clinicians do know something and they know some of these things by intuition, by felt sense, et cetera, but they have to be held to account to focusing on and changing processes that are of known importance for the goal that person comes in with and using techniques that are known to be helpful that would be likely to bump it, but making them up in the moment if those don't seem to fit this moment well. And always putting a little thing of, if I'm gonna be creative, if I'm gonna get out there, I'm gonna do something brand new for the first time, I better check back in and see, sometimes within minutes, sometimes within the session, whether or not these processes have changed. So I think you can have a firm anchor in evidence-based work that is more analytic, dynamic, contextual, individualized, and not have to have the free for all of, oh, I just like doing it, or not have the rigid rules that are put atop people that uh, aren't even how evidence-based therapy was ever done anyway. It's just how it's written about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, a very liberating approach, I would say. And uh, also, I guess it makes you focus more on assessment again and again, like what, what am I doing? Am I doing it right? Is it working? It. Yeah. And it has that spirit of some things that practitioners like, like feedback informed therapy. Yeah, but feedback informed therapy in terms of just the therapeutic alliance and symptoms, that's not good enough. Why? Because it doesn't predict long-term outcomes. <laughs> it, it, you know, just the therapeutic alliance predicts all and no, it doesn't mediate outcomes. There's only four or five studies showing it as a successful mediator. Stefan Hoffman and I and Joe Sorochi have done this massive review of all the mediational studies ever done in the history of the universe. And we there's about a thousand of them right now with wait list or treatment as usual as controls and some kind of psychosocial intervention. Mm -hmm. And if you look at all of that, you know, the therapeutic alliance doesn't show up very often, not because it's not important, but because it's hard to make one arm of the study give you dramatically better therapeutic alliances. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's a clinician factor. Yeah. But people need to know how to do this. And actually, that's that processes of change can help. I can explain that in a second. But where I'm going with this is that. Uh, I think we can be evidence-based in a, in a different way that's actually more rigorous scientifically. It doesn't commit the ergodic error. It takes advantage of all this basic science and process of change knowledge and uh, takes the shackles off, but and then holds people account to knowing a lot. You have to know a lot about basic behavioral principles, evolutionary science principles, social change principles, cognitive principles, emotional change principles. You need to know a lot, but that's because we're doing something incredibly complex. We're trying to change the lives of individuals and that's hard. And not harm them in the process as well. Exactly. I think that's a, I think we've done harm in this era of evidence-based therapy. Um, you know, some of, can I, this will seem like a tangent, but it's not. Some of these categories that we're used to using, let me just ask you this. What do you suppose uh, Carl Pearson, Pearson's R correlations, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Sir Ronald Fisher, the Fisher's Z, et cetera, mm -hmm. what do you suppose they were professors of? <laughs> Something mathematical, maybe? You'd think, right? And no, that wasn't wasn't something mathematical. 
Statistics, so maybe. No, it wasn't. Okay. Here's the answer. They're professors of eugenics. Oh, wow. Oh. Well. <laughs> oh. Not a and nice thing to know. And you see why? Well, of course, it's not. Let's uh, create the uh, norm. Let's create the bell curve. And mm -hmm. then we can decide who shall breed. Yeah. Literally. Mm hmm. And guess who won't? Well, you gay? No, you don't get to breed. Mm. Gay folks don't. No, no. You're black, you're brown. No, you don't. You're not the one. I mean, you know, this has a dark history. And what are we doing right now? I, I know people don't mean to do this, but when we're shoving people into, oh, you, you're a borderline. Boy, I'm just going like, ah. How did, how, yes. And some of those labels, once they're known, will never leave them. I'm looking, watching the Olympics and God bless, you know, Simone who said, I'm not doing the, the overall thing in gymnastics because this is just too stressful. You know, I, I, now I would want to give her the supports that she could actually do this, but I think it's kind of cool that young people and some of our heroes are actually stepping up and saying, I've got a mental health issue without necessarily, I hope they don't just climb inside a, a, a diagnosis. It's hard to be human and we need a softer, more compassionate culture because it isn't just the folks in the bell curve at the tips. These mental health challenges are challenges, not for one out of five people, but for five out of five people. And yeah. if, this year, if this year of COVID didn't convince you of that, I don't know what would. So how can we be of use to each other? And how can we create a science that is of use to each other when we're talking about all of us 24-7 needing to look at our mental strength and resilience and continuing to work on it, knowing that sometimes we're going to have to say, I'm not, doing the, I'm not doing more on the overall, even though... A thousand people are going oh how could you step away from that no yeah well it, that's life that's life yeah sometimes that's what should be done mm -hmm. that's true okay now i'd probably like to make a step back to therapeutic yes. alliance because that's a very popular questions and in, in mm -hmm. russia also and this thing like Therapeutic alliance is what makes it work is a, a very popular idea. And um, well, I guess I'd like to hear your point of view on uh, how necessary it is, for example, to develop psychological flexibility, because, well, my personal interest is in self-help. It's like yes. more affor uh, available affordable, whatever. Sure. But uh, every time you talk about self-help, you hear this, there's no therapist and it's harder and mm, stuff like that. So I really like to hear your point of view on that. How necessary yeah. is that? Well, the impact of self-help is impressive. You have to say some of these studies on books, for example, with you know, two thirds of what you get out of a course of therapy for a, you know, a $20 book. This is pretty amazing. And I think, uh, you know, but that doesn't mean one size fits all and so forth. It doesn't mean that everybody wants to interact with an app or that, so forth. The therapeutic alliance is important, but I think it's important because it's a teaching tool. And most of the relationship oriented therapists, therapies have said that. I mean, the more psychodynamic folks have long said that you have to internalize the relationship, uh, for example. Well, I think this makes a lot of sense. And uh, the way I usually explain this is to ask people to think of somebody who's powerfully lifted them up in your life, in their lives, somebody who really has made a difference. And when you have somebody in mind, somebody, you know, a coach or a teacher or a friend or a lover or a spouse or a sibling or whatever, spiritual leader, whatever, uh, here are the questions I'd have. When you're with that person, did you feel profoundly accepted for who you are? Were you constantly judged or is that kind of out of the room? When they're with you, would they be with you or are they looking at their watch on their half attending to you, like waiting for this to end? When your eyes met, did you see a human being? 
And did you see that you were being seen? Did you know that you were of importance in that moment to the person? Did what you care about matter to that person? Or did they not even ask the questions about what you really care about? What's of importance to you? Would they step over you or violate your values, but you really care about deeply without second thought? And when you were together, could you be in ways that would fit the opportunities of the moment? If something happened, in, would you be able to go with the flow or was it always one way and up to that other person? Well, you as an act trained person will know that I've asked questions about psychological flexibility. Yeah. And so here's what I can say. I pretty much know the answers to those questions and to everybody who's listening to this. You were uplifted or empowered by people who you felt accepted by, seen, who you were with as consciously as, as a human being. You were not constantly judged and what you cared about mattered and you could be together in ways that fit the opportunity of the situation. Those are the six flexibility processes. So in other words, you were uplifted by somebody who modeled psychological flexibility for you. That's why they empowered you because you did internalize some of that because your grandma said, okay, that's okay, dear. I know that was that F that failure was not so good, but you're a smart girl. You're going to be, you know, who was there when you had stumbled and fallen and picked you back up. For example, grandma was modeling something for you in that. And if you've had very unhealthy models, if you're abused, if you're rigid, or you're raised by parents who are hypercritical and so forth, you're going to struggle. You're going to have to see a therapist to have to wind some of that back and to find somebody else. Like who? Like your therapist. Who will do what? Who will do things like listen to the hell of your own history and not go, oh my God, you're that disturbed? Really? That, oh God, I've never heard anything so awful. Yeah, I don't think I can help you. Here's something wrong. You did what? If they're going to judge you and run out of the room when pain shows up. And of course, we do this as therapists, not mean to. If we've got an issue that we're not open to at all, let's say sexuality, and then our client raises an issue of sexuality, it somehow touches us and somehow or another we change the subject, we just harmed our client. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we taught them a little instance of psychological rigidity. They saw it and they will save you at the cost of their own therapy. Doesn't mean you have to be, you know, Buddha. All you need to know is, is that it's of importance. You can actually say, this is really hard for me to hear. I have some issues myself, you know, that, that uh, and let's walk into it. Let's walk into it when somebody's talking about abuse history, let's say, or whatever. What did you do? You modeled attention, acceptance, openness, cognitive flexibility. So when we've done mediator models where we put in psychological flexibility changes in the client and the therapeutic alliance, individually, each will mediate ACT outcomes. In part because actually ACT does help in the therapeutic alliance. Why? Because when you teach those skills, I just mentioned to clinicians, they get more powerful working alliances. They actually do. But when you put them in there individually, they mediate. They're functionally important parts of the pathway of change. When you put them into a multiple mediator model and you allow each to compete, psychological flexibility wipes out the other relationship. Mm. It's no, no longer significant. It's been shown multiple times. Not because it's not important, but because it's important in so far as when you model and instigate and support psychological flexibility, the client internalizes it and begins to themselves become more psychologically flexible. If that second shoe doesn't hit the ground, you can have the queen of the universe as your therapist and feel small around them and not empowered by them. You have to internalize what a good alliance models, supports and instigates. 
And that's what ACT tries to do. So I think I'm down with the importance of the therapeutic alliance. I do think there's a lot you can do without necessarily having that. But when we have that, for goodness sakes, let's make use of it, but let's know how. So the thing that I would say is, uh, yeah, get feedback, but not just on the therapeutic alliance or symptoms as in, you know, feedback on form therapy, get feedback on processes of change. And if you don't see your client becoming more psychologically flexible, start looking, am I modeling inflexibility? Are the things I'm doing that are creating a, a barrier for the client? Am I willing to go into the hell of their history in a values-based journey where my eyes are wide open and I'm with this person knowing how painful that is? You know, if you're doing therapy, you know you go home wanting to cry at your sessions sometimes. That's the job we have. Not the job of crying, but I mean of having the kind of openness where of course that would be what we would Hurtful. do. You know, yeah. It hurts to hear about what has happened to people. And if you're like me, you have this thought, man, if that had happened to me, I'd be sitting on the other side of the room and you'd be sitting over here. Uh, so yeah, that's what I would say. Um, there's a devolutionary theme that I want to point out to people. If you say just the therapeutic alliance matters, there's no way you can build a profession around that. Why? Because we have good evidence that the more training you get in psychology and psychotherapy, the less normal you are and the, the harder it is to get in there and listen to normal people who by the way, don't have PhDs or master's degrees. So yeah. you're socializing yourself right out of, you wanna have a good therapeutic alliance? Let's just do a little sorting and get some good grandmas in there and who really know how to do that. If you think that's psychotherapy, we should just have all the psychotherapists be really good grandmas. <laughs> that's a nice model of therapeutic alliance. <laughs> that, Actually, I, yeah. You know, we're deprofessionalizing our field mm -hmm. to do this. I, there's, a, there's a wisdom in it in the sense of this is a human interaction and we need to be work on being fully human in these interactions. And the science of psychological flexibility can help us do that. The science of processes of change can help us do that. But don't go too far and say it's the only thing that matters because then you've destroyed the, the disciplinary basis of what we're trying to do it and you don't allow us to progress. And, uh, I don't think that you can show much evidence that non-scientific based psychotherapies have progressed. We have our heroes from 100 years ago. We have our heroes from 50 years ago. We have our heroes now. Okay, fine. It's just like art, literature. Has there been real progress in art and literature? Are modern novelists, you know, better than Tolstoy? Uh, really? You know, I, I, it, it's an argument, right? In physics, it's not an argument. Modern mm -hmm. physicists are orders of magnitude better than the heroes of physics from 100 years ago. Why is psychology not part of that prog progressivity? We're too young. We're learning. <laughs> we have to learn. Exactly. I agree with that. But we need to learn and then do better. Yeah. You can't just say we're too young and no, the clock is ticking. Because in the modern world, things like COVID, et cetera, but not just that, economic disparities, but not just that, ethnicity and, and religious bias and, you know, sexual orientation, you know, objectification, dehumanization, but not just that, climate change, not just that, immigration, not just, if we don't give the modern world the tools they need, I mean, we can't trust politicians to know what to do. We cannot. I, mean, I look around the world and I say a lot of these things are going in the wrong direction. I mean, I can't go outside right now because there's smoke where I am. It is so intense from the fires that are only about 30 miles from where I am. But I literally can walk outside. Why? Because of climate change. Yeah. What are we going to do about that? Quick, what do the psychologists say? Yeah. They say almost nothing. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's actually one of the questions that I'm really eager to ask um, about psychologists saying nothing. 
And it's kind of like an ethical question. Like if you look into the ethics code, we are like not supposed to have a public opinion. And um, some people in pure cognitions actually are very passionate about that because like here in Russia, locally, we have lots of uh, unfair things going on. Like there's um, legislative uh, stuff against LGBT people and yeah. uh, whatever yeah. else. And um, well, I think that we can say that it's a position of pure cognitions that psychologists should have an opinion. But then sure. again, if you go and say like uh, um, homosexuality is okay, whatever else is okay, we need to fight climate change. This makes you biased. And if you have like a client who's homophobic or sure. uh, I don't know, a believer that there is no climate change, sure. it like complicates the process with the client. So what should we do? <laughs> should we have an opinion or not? Should we post it on social media or not? Well, I think we let's partition this out. Um, when I paint my house, that doesn't mean that it's psychology. This is me painting my house. Yeah. And so psychology can be about everything. You could do a psychological analysis of painters. Absolutely. You could do that or of workers. You could do that. But just because that's our role to study human behavior doesn't mean that when we enter into a political arena or et cetera, that we're specially anointed. We're just people. And so with the hat on of a citizen and a person who cares and so forth within how our societies work and they work in different, different ways in different parts of the world, we try to make a difference. That's different than what can we say as behavioral scientists and behavioral professionals with regard to what does the discipline know about how to deal with some of these challenges and putting that into the cultural stream, the political stream, the policy stream, et cetera, in a way that's not arrogant. It's not that we know the answers, but we know some of what's imp of importance. Uh, my first book actually was called Environmental Problems, Behavioral Solutions. So I was a full-time environmental activist before becoming a psychology student and then a psychologist. And I left the area. It's still one of the few books still in print. It's 40 some years later, you can still buy it because almost nobody was in this area back in the day. My dissertation was on how to, as a clinical psychologist was on how to reduce energy use monthly in your home and uh, you know, because I looked at this with it and say, here's what's going to happen. And of course, it's happened. We knew these things were going to happen. We knew it 40, 50 years ago. I'm old enough to say that and have been there. I mean, at the first Earth Day and so forth. But when we step into the public sphere, we step in, we step in, I think, as psychologists, but or as individuals. As individuals and citizens, we are free to do whatever happens in our culture. That's all fine. But we ha should have no obligation. Somebody should come and say, hey, you have to be the part of this party or demonstrate. No, 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 dude, you don't, you know, I'll take care of my own politics. But now in terms of what we know professionally, uh, there, I think we have an ethical responsibility to give voice and, and to give voice to what's known. Uh, I'll give you an example. Objectification and dehumanization of other people across all the different forms that is known has a, co a common core. If you take measures of racial bias and sexual orientation bias and bias against people who are overweight and bias against uh, yeah, and ethnicity, religious groups, and I don't know, do all of it you'll get a common core of this, what's sometimes been called authoritarian distancing. It's I'm up, I'm different, I'm away and you're a threat. It's kind of that posture of like that, yeah? Now, what does that predict? Uh, and where does it come from? Well, here's what we know in the, in the ACT universe. If you were poor at taking the perspective of other people, you can easily get into that posture. 
if you're poor at having empathy, when you try to take their perspective, you can easily get in that posture. And if you get overwhelmed by painful thoughts and feelings and, res and when that happens, you shut down and avoid, you can get in that posture. So it's predicted by perspective taking, empathy and experiential avoidance. What do those th things predict? They predict interesting things, not just prejudice across all the forms. They also predict being unhappy. And if you've ever been around people who are very rigid, who are quick to objectify and dehumanize, dehumanize have you ever seen a really happy person? Yeah, ever? Probably not. Yeah. I've never, I can't think of one person if they really crawl into what le that leads to of hate, you know, that rock that's inside you, of that sneer that shows up in your face, that harshness in your treatment of others, it bounces back on you. Because if, if think it through, if I can't afford to feel what I feel when I see you feeling, which is what empathy is, that means I can't fully feel myself. If I can't take your perspective, it means I can't step back and take perspective on me either. And if I can't show up even when it's hard, it means I have to run so fast that even my own history is not running as fast as I am. Mm -hmm. Well, that's impossible. The way I usually say this, and you probably shouldn't, but you know, Hitler is not a happy man. Probably. There's no way. I mean, he died the way people would die. Yeah. With that. And so here's the positive part of that. Now, can we step in in a different way? Can we, for example, step into, let's say, there's a political issue around LGBT. Can we, without necessarily just functioning as a politician or a political person, as a, get in and help the culture with perspective taking, with empathy, and with experiential openness, knowing that not only are we helping the person who's been objectified and dehumanized, we are helping the perpetrator too. We're helping the objectifier too. This is not good for the human heart. It's not, we know that as a scientific fact. So we're not in there as politicians, we're in there out of the loving extension of the knowledge we have. But be careful, don't be arrogant. Take perspective, even in the moment of teaching perspective taking of how hard that is. For example, if you're a very religious person and you've been told that you know God will condemn people who are, okay, I don't have to challenge that religious belief, but I can say some things like, and what does your God say about forgiveness? You know, if you know enough about the, the traditions, you know, all of our major religious traditions, all of them have compassion, empathy, perspective, taking values. They, they're all in there. In, in my country, the military chaplains have all decided they're gonna be trained in act perspective, in act motivational interviewing and problem solving therapy, because they they got together as religious leaders, their chaplains, after all their rabbis and ministers and imams and priests, and they saw inside the act work something that resonated with their wisdom traditions and their spiritual traditions. So I think there's a way of a softening the conversations and helping to empower a values-based journey that our culture needs to go through worldwide. Mm -hmm. It isn't just country by country, it's worldwide. It does no good in terms of climate change if a few countries do it and many other big countries don't. Yeah. Excuse me, it does no good. The fires will burn in Siberia just as well as they burn in Tahoe. Mm -hmm. And they are, yeah. and they will, and it will be worse. You know, the permafrost will melt and it will be worse. You can see it coming, yeah? In fact, it's now unavoidable. The next hundred years, we're gonna have amazing challenges, but can we put into the culture through even what we do in psychotherapy, but also things like scaling into small groups. Can you create in your practice, for example, in 
a group that's more values based, open, psychologically flexible within your work team. Can you work with business and industry to do that in other ways? Can we put it into the schools? Can we put it into our church groups? Can we, you know, and uh, I've done some of that, with, including with this book, Pro Social, where we work with Lynn Ostrom's uh, Nobel Prize winning design principles for how cooperative groups work. So I, that's the way I would answer. Uh, be a psychologist when you're being a psychologist. And there you have an ethical responsibility to speak the truth about what is known, but be careful about conflating political action because too easily what that can lead to is uh, the important voice that we have in the culture that we'd have if we come in cleanly and we're really on everybody's side. Like we're not on any one person's side, we're on everybody's side, right? We're psychologists. Mm -hmm. uh, that will be lost if we allow ourselves to get shoved over into a particular category. Um, so. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, actually. I think it would make it a bit easier for many people who are like uh, talking in the public field to accept what they're doing without guilt and at the same time evaluate it more honestly like are we doing it right okay i'm monitoring the time as well and there are so many questions that i have to choose something from oh yeah i wanted to ask about uh the flexibility processes it, this wasn't my question this was a question of uh, one of uh, like the most uh knowledgeable colleague of mine uh, about six processes in hexaflex should we consider them therapy results processes or behavior so uh would be very nice to hear what should okay. we think of it well uh i'm a behavior so i learned to use the word behavior to mean all of the things we do all of the things we do every single thing we do not just muscle movements not glands and secretions though but thinking feeling remembering sensing all of those things are behavior however in the mainstream way that people talk very often, behavior is just overt behavior people can see that looks like movement. And in our language streams, which after all are thousands of years old, and they're, but they're deeply into our enculturation from the time we were a baby, you know, we have categories, we talk about emotions. We had to learn as a human culture to do that. Almost all our emotional terms are metaphors. If you go back in the etymology of them, I mean, even something in English so simple as saying, I want something came from an old Norse word, I believe, vaunt, which meant missing. So you have to imagine a world in which to talk about an emotional reaction of wanting something, you had to say, missing, missing milk. And like, <laughs> it's pretty primitive, right? And all these other things, I'm inclined to go, inclined just like an inclined plane. Mm -hmm. I'm leaning towards going, leaning just about to fall. So, but, okay, so now we have all this emotional terms and we're inventing them, we make up things. We, we actually see recently, we could easily do it, make up emotional terms. It's useful because it allows you to talk about behavioral predispositions about things that would be of importance to you in ways that others can understand and help you with. Um, so it's become more elaborated. These metaphors then become frozen. They get taught to children very young and they treat emotions as if they're things. So the same thing. So emotions and cognition and sense of self and uh, attention and motivation, overt behavior. Those six are the ones that are inside the six psychological flexibility processes. Uh, you know, motion, primarily acceptance, and uh, by acceptance also not clinging. It isn't just not avoiding, but also means not clinging, and so forth around the six hexagon. Why would we call them processes? Processes, all that means is from a Latin word that means a parade or a per procession or a sequence. Mm. Yeah, going they on sequences they yeah, mm -hmm. exactly and they're meant just as a sequence of things people do in a context that lead to an outcome it's like a journey a walk a procession a parade uh why would we focus so much on 
processes because in therapy, we're trying to help this parade happen in all of these dimensions I just mentioned, plus the sociocultural level, you know, a person who's not connected, who's all alone, who's not part of a group, that's not the kind of monkey we are. That's not the kind, this is not what normal, what people usually need. They, it's your culture, your, your group is important. Your relationships are important. And the biophysiological level, just of what you're doing with diet, exercise, sleep, health, how the brain is working, what the epigenetic regulation of stress-related gene systems are, et cetera. All those things are important. Processes exist in all of these areas. And the hexagon is focused on the psychological ones, but you can extend each one into the sociocultural ones. Acceptance extends easily into compassion for others. Diffusion and cognitive flexibility extends easily into understanding the perspective of others and being genuinely interested in their views. Values extend into group values. What are our values as a couple, as a family, as a community, as a clinic, as a nation, as the world? Yeah. So these six as extended socially, and then remembering that health matters and the, so the underlying biophysiological ones, you can do what we've done. We've looked at every study ever done in the history of the universe on processes of change that were successful mediators of outcomes for any psychosocial intervention with any psychosocial outcome with treatment as usual or no treatment as a control condition. You need that because two active treatments, the mediation between them are sometimes odd because you're looking at differences between two arms and they both may be both actively moving a process and so it won't shut up as important. But if you look at no treatment or treatment as usual, it will show up as important. Well, you know, the, I'm, we're now giving talks on this. The we is Joe Sorochi, Stefan Hoffman, and myself, <laughs> and our labs on this project. And psychological flexibility will account easily for about 45% of, of all, every mediator known ever been shown frequently, at least three or four or five times in the literature. If you're friendly to it, for example, you start saying things like mm, anxiety, sensitivity, is actually kind of an uh, experiential avoidance or emotional rigidity item, isn't it? Yes, it is, etc. You just do that, you end up with 80% or so. And the ones that are left, uh, well, things like self-efficacy, but which is a very big dog in the pen, lots of studies showing self-efficacy matters. But believing that you can take charge and do something in your life, isn't that something that comes out of the values and committed action side? Yes, and I can show you the randomized trials that self-efficacy regularly moves powerfully with act interventions and, and it fits in this. So bottom line, here's what I'm saying. Uh, focusing on process of change in the psychological flexibility model as it's socially extended and remembering that physical health and your body matters uh, can give you in just a relatively simple model, basically almost everything we know about the processes of change in all forms of therapy for all outcomes ever done in the history of the world. And so that's pretty good. And, and it's there because we did bottom up work. You know, we did the work from 1981 through 84, where we did three randomized trials on ACT, it wasn't even called ACT to the first ACT book in 1999. And then the first big randomized trial, Bond and Bunce in the year 2000. We're about to post another chunk of uh, randomized trials from parts of the world that are not easily indexed. And we're gonna be up close to 800 randomized controlled trials of ACT. In a couple of years, we'll pass a thousand. Never mind the four or 5,000 studies on these processes of change. So. Uh, I don't know if I've given too big a broad an answer to your question, but it processes of change are behaviors, yes, but I like using more usual language that will allow everybody to come in and play who are not behaviorists. Mm -hmm. 
because I want the humanist, I want the psychoanalyst, I want the systems person, the existentialist, the cognitive therapist, come on in. You know, let's look at the processes of change. How do you measure them? Let's target them, see whether it makes a difference. All hands on deck, this old era of schools and, you know, my way or the highway and these little islands and an archipelago. Oh, please, it's so primitive. Is that where we're gonna end up as a field forever? Yeah, it's Hopefully a sad not. vision. It's a sad vision of a scientific field. Mature sciences don't do that. They figure out a way to build bridges and to come to some consensus so we can build those bridges and our efforts in process-based therapy and seeing ACT as a form of it won't take away the psychological flexibility model. It won't take away ACT. What it will do is enrich and add, um, extend and elaborate, broaden and build. And that's not anything that we should resist. Yeah, that's true. Okay, uh, thanks for this answer. I think now it would be a good time to switch to something a bit more easy, something uh, more uh, like personal, like not about the processes and the science. And um, there was this thing um, that I wanted to ask about um, one of the techniques that I like a lot, uh, like, you know, imagining yourself from the future, giving yourself now with a problem, uh, yeah. like a, a note saying like, what you yeah, should yeah. do or think or whatever. Sure. So um, I wanted to um, ask you to do that like the other way around and uh, think from where you are now, uh, what note would you like to give yourself as a like a psychologist, a beginner or like somewhere along the way? Uh, what would be advice you would give to yourself or maybe well, well, before getting to an answer of what advice I might give myself as an individual, what I'd point out here is that flexibility you just showed is exactly what an ACT clinician should do. Because what's inside the exercise of going to a distant future where life has evolved in a positive way, looking back at yourself, uh, is one of the three key perspective taking cognitive frames of time, place, and person. And knowing that this kind of witnessing, noticing, aware, I hear now part of us has something to do with the ability to move perspective across people, across place, and across time. It's not all of it. It's not 100% of it, but it has something to do with that. It's part of it. it allows you to be creative. So let's like take the example of a wiser future looking back. I could also sit here in the present and take something I'm struggling with, put it into a younger self, bring that little kid in front of me, you know the exercise, yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And ha have a little conversation with what that little kid really wanted and how hard it was and what that thought that now I have that's difficult or that emotion that now I have, what was it like back then? And whether that little person feel as though they needed to do, you know? It's very common for people to cry when they do this, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they see something in that shift of perspective. But I could do the same thing by saying, you've asked me a really good question, but before I answer it, let's just mentally go over here. Now let's just look back at those people over there. They're having a conversation across great space. It's crazy, it's just in the modern world. They're zooming across many thousands of miles. And the clock is ticking and the old guy's trying to give good answers. And there's an effort to try to make sure the questions have been asked. What do you think he should do with that question? Or what do you think she should ask? Or what's not being said, etc. We'd have a different perspective on it, yeah? By place and person going to the other side of the room looking back. When you know that, you can be very creative with your clients. You can do an empty chair technique and not feel as though, oh, I'm stealing from the Gestalt therapy. <laughs> yeah. Now you're not, you're, you're just doing therapy inside a process-based model. And so, uh, but I, you asked, also asked if it was a, uh, a question, uh, it was a personal question you're asking. So I'm gonna try to answer, what would I wanna to say to my future self? 
I probably ask to not be judged too harshly. Uh, I hope you can be uh, show some kindness, and I hope you see, and I hope where you've arrived that there was, uh, even when I was getting it wrong, that the values you now hold, I hold too. Uh, you're looking at you in a phase of development. And so uh, the important part, I think, of even thinking in that way is I hope what's reflected is that I was a loving person. And uh, when you look back, uh, you see my efforts to try to bring that into myself and my relationship, my family and into the world. And if not, I ask for your forgiveness. Oh, distant self. Um, now, I don't know if that's an adequate answer for the distant self, but for me, answering that as an exercise is helpful, I think, because it reminds me again just of the values journey. And uh, even as I said that, I just for a second flitted forward to the fact that my wife and I are going to drive up to Lake Tahoe through the smoke and get my son and his bicycle because he's at a birthday party and it's going to take an hour to get there. And um, just what I want to reveal or be how I want to do that ride in a way that's loving for my wife and for my son. And uh, so a good way to spend uh, a little bit of time and maybe uh, reminding myself that uh, what I'm up to in life moments matters because after all, that's what I wanted to talk to the distant future mm -hmm. self. About. Be interesting to do it and see experimentally and I'd actually use that exercise and to take some process measures and see how often do people, for example, just with that instruction, arrive at something that it was values elucidating? Yeah, I guess it would be common. Mm, quite often, probably. Yeah. Well, if you use it in your therapy, let me know, because then maybe I will steal it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thanks for the answer, and I think uh, I tried to drag you into content, and uh, like <laughs> you fought back. <laughs> <laughs> and made it experiential so it's a good demonstration of act <laughs> i guess <laughs> yeah okay so i think we should have time for one more question right still 20 minutes or 19 mm. minutes by my okay point. okay so just one minute uh oh maybe uh like potentially tough one about the criticism of act. Uh, yeah. Would you say, uh, like, what are the critics that you hear more often and uh, like your answers to that? Uh, it's quite a broad question, but maybe you have some. Yeah, well, it's changed over time, you know, when, you know, act was the overnight sensation that took 20 years to create. I mean, when it came, especially 2005, Get Out of Your Mind Into Your Life, was written up in Time Magazine in the US in a five page story. I sent a copy to my mother, you know, this was a very big deal. And, um, and the reporter, the late John Cloud, wrote it as a kind of an arm wrestling between Tim Beck and myself, between co traditional cognitive therapy, cognitive behavior therapy, and the new wave the third wave, what soon became called the third, uh, was just being called the third wave. Uh, when, in my presidential address for ABCT, I coined that term. Mm -hmm. Well, first thing I did was called Tim and say, well, why don't we get on stage and let people know that actually this is the reporter writing a story. Uh, he was a little busy, we weren't able to do it, but I had sent my first PhD to him, my first Rob Zettel. Uh, I've had almost 50 PhDs, but my first one, my precious first born, I sent Tim on the internship. So the idea that I was here to bring down Tim back is uh, appalling and not true, but it's old magazines. Um, but, and, but it is true that there was something, you know, 
kind of different about it. And so in these early days, what would happen is we would be said that we're a cult, that we're not evidence-based, we don't have any studies, uh, it's woo-woo, all that kind of stuff. The cult part came, although there were no qualities of a, of a cult there, and I'll tell that story in just a second in a way that lands into the current way, but because we're experiential. And why? Because the core of the model is that the logical, analytical, judgmental mind is not all of us. And while it's an important part of us, and there's even a theory that, that is not just a theory, but now actively saving developmental, children with developmental disabilities who can't speak, et cetera, relational frame theory in those, that long period of darkness was developed, which is a theory of how this happens and can be used to bring people into the language and community so that they will have these kind of problems, which is in fact what happens. Um, still, because we want to rein in the excesses of analytic judgmental rule-based learning into things that are broader, more contingency shaped, more, more based on emotion, sensation, intuition, we have different ways of talking about it. We train experientially. And not only there are principles that you have to know and there's experiences you go through and there's techniques that you learn. You know that inside the way that ACT is trained. Well, that's not the way traditional cognitive therapy is trained or traditional CBT. And um, so this is a cult. That was an early one. Now, the fact that, you know, where are the data? As my friend Lars Jorn Ost said, uh, when, Steve, where are the data? Uh, and then he, uh, we invited him to come to our conference and say, tell us what's wrong. And they would say, you know, we are not doing the data right. You're not doing the studies right. And for three years, we brought Lars Jorn to our world conferences. Eventually, he took it so seriously. Now he's become a person who writes very critical articles about the data. But it gets harder and harder because the data are exploding. Uh, and you know, now we're headed towards 800 randomized trials and several thousand. I mean, please, you can't say where the data anymore. Nobody can say that. There's a random, new randomized trial every three days over the last three years, every three days. I mean, you can't say it anymore. Um, Another uh, criticism came up is that you're here to take down other forms of evidence-based therapy. You know, the, the original kind of Time Magazine idea that I'm here, the wild crazy. It's very unfair, but they took a picture of T Tim Beck with his bow tie and John went and visited, he became a friend, he's died, but, but uh, John, the reporter, went and visited him three times till he finally got Tim to say something foolish. He said, the last time I heard about the third wave, it was past life regression. Uh, so it made, it look, made him look rigid, which he's not. And they had a picture of me on a motorcycle, my motorcycle at the time, which I had to sell, sell when I had little Stevie because I didn't want to have him have brain damaged father, but I love motorcycles. I was sitting on my big motorcycle and they took a picture that had red eye in it. And any photographer knows how to eliminate red eye, but it was there in Time Magazine with it not being eliminated because they wanted it to look like crazy lunatics are taking over the bow tie and conventional. Well, so what we did, uh, the person who was most defending Tim was probably Stefan Hoffman. He wrote very harsh articles. This is old wine and new bottles. Act is nothing but Merida therapy, repackaged, you know, things I, I didn't even know what Merida therapy was the way, way, way into the act work. Well, what we did is we invited Stefan to come and stand on stage and have a plenary and tell us what's wrong. Cults don't do that. And, but we also asked him to have some fun. So we, when he went to, we have our follies, if you come to the world conference where we make fun of each other. And we, Horton Here's a Who that was just out the, uh, uh, the movie. And um, I don't know if you know that children's story, but we did a little thing where the CBT kangaroo wasn't able to hear the tiny little creatures who were on the desk saying, we are here, we are here. This is the CBT 
the CBS group and the big elephant was trying to protect the CBSers. Well, Stefan just laughed his ass off and it started a relationship. And I was in Germany and fell over and fainted on stage out of what it turned out to be an arrhythmia that I didn't know I had. Who shows up at two in the morning by my bedside is Stefan Hoffman. We become best of friends, closest colleagues and process-based therapy as a result. So most people who would say, oh, you're here to burn down the house in CBT are now kind of looking at the act folks and saying, we like the house you're building because the sensitivities that were inside the act have led to process-based therapy and process-based therapy gives CBT a whole way forward as the protocol for syndromes era collapses that is evidence-based in a new way. And Stefan is a monster in terms of research and you know, and intellect. And uh, so what are we getting now? Now that we've got those two, what we get now are things like, you haven't defined psychological flexibility well, or the AAQ is contaminated by distress and all of your, excuse me. I mean, there's 125 measures to psychological flexibility. There are overt behavioral measures. There are you don't have to have self-report at all. And by the way, psychometrics violates ergodicity. The psychometrics itself is a top-down category on individuals kind of enterprise, which is scientifically wrong. My mentor's mentor was Alan Edwards and my mentor's mentor mentor had the first measure of uh, IQ in infants, A.R. Gilliland. I come out of that tradition, but excuse me, it's just wrong. And so we're, I, we're getting criticisms now that are, yeah, but, mm -hmm. and that are saying, yeah, but your measures are not good enough. Well, all of them, and the, there's a lot of them going on. Uh, yeah, but your concepts aren't well-defined. They mean many different things. This is a community. This is an effort of a worldwide community over time. And this is the kind of criticism that any graduate student can take by taking any concept in any area, doing a meta-analysis and being a smart ass. Oh, you don't define it well enough and there's many definitions in your measures. How many times have you read that article? It's the same article. If you just take out the terms, it's the same article. What we're trying to do is create a progressive tradition that is built on well, elaborated of philosophical principles of this modification of pragmatism that I think eliminates the real harmful things that can happen in pragmatism. What's good for GM is good for the country is not true. It was never true. It's a capitalist ripoff of pragmatism. You can be a responsible pragmatist. Functional contextualists are. Principles Behavioral principles, but not just direct contingencies. You're doing more than the bird outside the window. Operant classical conditioning is not the end of basic science. We need modern motion science, cognitive science, and we've done that with the RFT work. Evolutionary principles, why? Because we're part of the life sciences. In any area of the life sciences, if you ask why, pretty soon they'll answer because it evolved that way. Only in the behavioral science do we not do that, and time's up. It's time for us to enter into the modern world of life science and in a multi-dimensional, multi-level extended evolutionary way. So we're getting criticisms that to me now feel, I'm sorry for saying it this way, they feel ill-informed, not in what they say, but in the failure to appreciate what a research an intellectual and practical community can do over time as things evolve and change. And so sometimes the criticisms have already been answered. We're well aware of them. We're working on our measures. We're amplifying them across not just self-report, but also uh, overt behavior, etc. Okay. We're working on the definition of terms, but this defining a term tightly doesn't mean that it's scientific. Bread recipes are very tightly defined. You think a baker's a scientist? Really? 
you know, they were back to the techniques question you asked. That's not a real vision of science at base practice. It's understanding the principles. I want to know the person who knows why yeast makes bread rise. Then that person might be a scientific baker, but not the one who just say, give me a teaspoon of it. Yeah. So uh, the criticisms now are serious, but often don't seem to appreciate the arc of what we're trying to do. And so very non-defensively you answer and you say, yes, yes, that's true. And, and then you point to what's happening and you invite people in. So I've given you a very long answer that uh, the early criticisms of its occult were because of misunderstanding the role of experience. And I do not back up one iota from that. I want my therapist to be to know from the inside out, if you have a psychology of the normal that's in foreign therapy, you better know it on the inside out because last time I checked, you're a person. And you can't do things to people that when they're done with you aren't helpful. That we just can't let ourselves get in that position. The, uh, you know, the, the issue of narrowness, we've shown, we build bridges. We've built bridges to evolutionary science, to cognitive therapy. We're actively doing it now with humanistic folks. I'm on the phone just yesterday with the head of the Erickson Foundation, with Milton Erickson's work. We're trying to show in the process-based work that we can reach people who've never done a randomized trial and help them become more evidence-based, not to validate what they're doing, but to help inform what they're doing so that they can get better. And so um, this last little era of, uh, of, of detailed criticisms, but that are unappreciative of the overall uh, research program um, I don't think are gonna land powerfully. I don't think many people care and we're only too happy to take those criticisms, use them, embrace them, learn from them. So criticize away, it's great, it'll help us. And we have a tradition of inviting our critics in and uh, we'll continue to do that and learn from them. And sometimes they've become best of friends and closest colleagues. Very resilient approach, I'd say, in, in terms of the whole community and development. Are there criticisms you're hearing in the last few minutes is this, that you, you want to put me in? Are there, is there a criticism that you get thrown at you as an act person in your country? or that uh, is not Well, I think uh, there's um, a little bit of, um, how do you say that in English? Well, we have um, special uh, features of our psychotherapeutic psychological community. And uh, there is criticism of evidence-based therapies in general, like you have no idea what you're saying. And if you are into ACT, you are obviously oriented into science. And um, this happens. Uh, and uh, I think uh, what we have is uh, a little bit of people who are a little bit rigid in understanding CBT. They say what a rigid CBT person would say about ACT. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you have both of those. But I think those will modify, the, the CBT critics will modify as, as process-based CBT catches hold and becomes process-based therapy. I'm not worried about them so much. The other ones, uh, my suggestion would be to just invite them to come and spend time with you and to look at your tapes. I mean, just the simple challenge. Have you ever been in an ACT workshop? Have you ever seen an ACT session? We'll eliminate 95% of those things because they're cartoons. They're based on categories. They're, you know, and they're categories that aren't true. They're, that don't fit. You know, oh, you're behavioral, you're scientifically, or oh, you, 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 so therefore you don't, excuse me, I'm me. If you really want to have a conversation, come and look, come, come. Nothing scary, do the workshop, you know, look at the tape. Uh, Les Greenberg, who's you know, one of the fathers of emotion-focused therapy, which came out of Gestalt therapy, which if you don't know, you should know, came out of the same wing of behavioral thinking as ACT. Hmm. Not Fritz Perls, but Ralph Hefferlein. Perls, Hefferlein, and Goodman. Paul Goodman was a psychoanalyst. Fritz Perls, you know, 
Ralph Hefferlein, who was he? He was a rat running behavior analyst at Columbia. He wanted to call it integrative therapy because it integrated radical behavioral thinking with humanistic thinking. And Fritz thought classic Wertheimer or Gestalt was coming back, which it never did. So he called it Gestalt therapy. Well, now it's emotion focused therapy, right? Les Greenberg were in this uh, big conference on emotion and um, I bring people up, I do my work, blah, 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 I show tapes, etc. And and he's been very sweet to me. He's on the on the back of the act book as an endorser and so forth. But he comes up and he says, Hayes, I love what you do. I hate your theory. <laughs> I don't see how you get from that theory to that. I said, Well, okay, okay. But we're fellow travelers in what we do, are we not? Yeah, we are. Okay, so different routes. And um, if you're an act person, you know how you get there. You, you, you see, and, and uh, you know, Sue Johnson also in EFT sort of, sort of sees that. So uh, the humanists should be our natural allies. The ones who are critical, the therapeutic alliance, blah, blah, blah. I just showed you in the answer on the therapeutic relationship, how you can do it. Yeah, we care about it so much. We actually want to have principles that teach you how to have really good ones. Mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty good. And, and just saying the therapeutic alliance doesn't necessarily give you those principles. So science can help. Um, that doesn't mean that we think that uh, those rules are the same. After all, you can have a science of lovemaking. It doesn't mean it's lovemaking. You can have a science of leaps of faith. That doesn't mean it is itself a leap of faith. You can have a science of sports. We're watching the Olympics. There's gold medals being won with act coaches. I know the, some of the coaches. Some of those Chinese folks, man, the Chinese Olympic team has act coaches all over it. Yeah. But the science of mental performance is not the same as mental performance. I mean, I went to spring training for baseball and because of the Toronto Blue Jays, all of the mental performance coaches are act people. But that doesn't mean I can hit a baseball. So, you know, I respect people who know how to get good, emotional, connected. And I think when they come and see your tapes, they'll see somehow or another, you know how to do that. And that will soften all these criticisms and really maybe help them to think that maybe it's even possible to have a science that's empowering of experiential journeys like that. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> we are now at our hard stop. Yeah, uh, yeah. Have a little boy to go drive up through smoke. Uh -huh. uh, okay, thank you so much. Us. Yeah, this was very inspiring and deep and broad and I'm looking forward to translating that and spreading the interview. Well, let me just say that I'm in closing for the community, you know, that your voice matters, your culture matters. And, uh, you know, we're a worldwide community of folks. So if you're, if you're interested in that, get connected to ACBS, you know, half of the members are outside of North America. We're, it's hard language wise, etc. We're trying to figure out a way in time and everything. It's hard. But, uh, you know, the journey that we're on together is one of trying to create a behavioral science more adequate to the human condition. And if you're interested in that, if something's exciting to you about that, there's a community that will support your work will give you almost anything you want. You can ask for questions, questions get them answered. You want resources, you'll be given them. And so uh, we're out here. Conversely, if you want to take what's in that and take it in a different direction, as long as it's a values-based journey, I hope you succeed. I hope that people who need to hear that will hear that and start acting. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Seeing how it moves forward. And yeah, I'll write to you when it's ready. Give you the link. Right. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Be safe.